My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For a time God turned his back upon his son. His son was dying on that cross for the sins of the world. And God turned his back. He could not look upon that scene. Jesus Christ died in the place of all mankind. I read the story one time about a man who was working on a, he was a mason, and he was working on a building that was a, a block building. And as he was getting prepared, he noticed down below that there was a flock of sheep roaming around down beneath him in a pasture nearby. And one of those sheep wandered around and got near the building. And the man looked down and it caused him to lose his footing. He slipped and he fell from the scaffold that was almost to the very top of that massive building. But when he fell, he fell on that little lamb that was down there. It killed the lamb, but he cushioned the fall of the man and the man lived. Man got to thinking about it. That lamb died for me. So the last stone he put in that building he inscribed that on that stone in memory of the lamb that saved his life. He died for me. And then he put the date. You know, that, that's just a story. That, that, that's just a, that, that's something that happened to a man. But almost 2,000 years ago, God gave his lamb, the lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. And the reason he did that is because mankind has fallen into sin. And unless someone does something to help him, man, because of his sin, can be lost eternally. Eternally lost. And Jesus Christ was the one who died in our place, Jesus Christ paid the debt for sin. His blood is precious because, you see, it's vicarious blood. He died in my place, and he paid the debt. He did not owe that debt, but he paid it in full. And he, I had a debt to, that I could not pay. There's nothing that I could ever do to pay my way out of the pit of sin. But God sent his lamb for that very reason. Precious blood. And how thankful each and every one of us ought to be today for the precious blood of Jesus. It is innocent blood, vicarious blood. But Jesus' blood is precious because it is abrogating blood. Now, I know that sounds like a big word, but again, let's break it down. What does that really mean? Well, it really means to blot out something, to take something out of the way. That's exactly what happened when Jesus died and shed his blood on Calvary. Listen to the Apostle Paul in Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which was against us, taking it out of the way, taking it out of the way, and nailing it, to the cross. When Jesus died, Jesus died to abrogate the Old Testament law, that is the law of Moses. Jesus Christ died to blot it out. Jesus Christ died to take it out of the way. Let's listen to some passages of Scripture. For example, in Galatians, the third chapter, the Apostle Paul wrote, the law, what law? The law of Moses. 
was a schoolmaster to do what? To bring us to Christ. That we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. You see, the law was just like a school bus bringing the children to school, bringing the children to the real teacher. And then at the end of the day, in ancient times, that tutor would take those children back home. But Jesus, the law was kind of, was like a school bus bringing us to Jesus Christ, the teacher, that we might be justified by faith. But after man is, Jesus has come, we are no longer under that law. Well, the question is, are we now justified by faith in Jesus Christ? If, if we are, then we're no longer under that Old Testament law, that is the law of Moses. Listen to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's use just a little bit of logic here. Let's use some common sense. If the law served the purpose of bringing us to Jesus Christ, that, that is, it served that purpose for the Jewish world. They were the ones subject to that law. Deuteronomy 5, verses 1 through 5. And the purpose of that law, according to Galatians 3.19, was to restrain the Jewish people till the seed would come. That is to keep the bloodline of Jesus pure until he would come into the world. He was the seed of Abraham, Galatians 3 and verse 16. And now that the seed, that is Jesus, has come, for the Jewish world to restrain them from sin. And, and when they did not follow that law, they fell into sin and God would, would chastise them. They'd always come back. God wanted the bloodline to be pure through whom Jesus would come. And the law served its purpose. And we are no longer under that law. Look at what Paul wrote in Romans, the seventh chapter and verse four. Wherefore you become dead to the law. How, are, how have we, were you dead to the law? By the body of Christ. That is by the death of Christ. We are now dead to that law by the body of Christ. And so we're no longer, men are no longer subject to that law. Now I've had people ask me this question when I would make some comments along this line. Does that mean, Brother Lambert, that you do not believe the Old Testament? Let, let me straighten that out right now. I, I believe every word of the Old Testament. I believe every word of it is true. But I am not amenable to the law of Moses. I'm not subject to the law of Moses. You see, it served its purpose in bringing men to Christ, the world to Christ. You see, we would not have Christ had it not been for the law to restrain the Jewish people and keep that bloodline pure. And so, yes, I believe every word of it. In Romans, the 15th chapter, in verse 4, Paul said, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. He's, what, what is he talking about? The Old Testament. The Old Testament is for our learning, and we learn by reading the Old Testament. Listen to Paul when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 14. Continue in the things that you have learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom that you have learned them, that from a child, from a child, you have known what? What did he know? The Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You see, because of Jesus, 
we have now that which was promised and predicted in the Old Testament. Someone has rightly said that the Old Testament was the New Testament concealed and that the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. There's a scarlet cord that runs through the entirety of the Bible from beginning to end. And that scarlet cord is the story about the Redeemer that would come into this world and die for mankind. I believe every word of the Old Testament. It's not a question of believing it. It's a question, are we subject to it today. And we cannot be subject to a law that has been abrogated, that has been done away. And so it's precious blood, precious blood, for three reasons that I've already given you. Number one, it is innocent blood. Number two, it is vicarious blood. That is, he did it for me. Number three, his blood is precious because it blotted out the old. It blotted out the Old Testament. But let me give you a fourth reason that this blood is precious. And it's precious because it is sealing blood. You see, when Jesus shed his blood, not only did he blot out the old, he sealed the new covenant with his blood. Listen to him in Matthew, the 26th chapter, verse 28. This is my blood of the new covenant. Of what covenant? The new covenant, not the old covenant, but of the new covenant, which was shed for many. Well, Jesus, why did you shed that blood for the remission of? Of sins. See, Jesus Christ shed his blood. What for what purpose? He shed his blood for the remission of sins. And he sealed the New Testament. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, when he, he shed his blood on that cross, not only did he take the old out of the way, Jesus gave the New Testament. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the ninth chapter of Hebrews, and we want to read starting in verse number 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of what? The New Testament. How did he do that? That by means of death. His death did that. His death he became the mediator of the New Testament by his death. Why? For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. What is that first testament? The law of Moses. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there also of necessity must be the death of the testator. The testator is the one who makes the testament. For a testament is, for where a testament is, there must, be, must also be necessity, the death of the testator. For a testament is a force, what does that mean? Enacted. Enacted. A testament is enacted when? After men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, let's analyze what we just read. Jesus Christ died, shedding his blood. And Jesus Christ abrogated the old law, but he sealed the New Testament. He is the mediator of the New Testament. And that was by his death. When Jesus shed his blood, he shed his blood for the sins of the whole world. I, I, I knew an elderly preacher, uh, the late Gus Nichols, who used to say that when Jesus died, he shed his blood, his blood went all the way back to Adam, and it goes forward until the end of time for all men, for the benefit of the sins of all mankind, that is of those that are obedient to God. 
And, for example, he would refer to someone in the Old Testament that would ask for forgiveness. And he would say, I believe that God forgave them. They had forgiveness kind of like a promissory note. They had it in promise of the fact that Jesus one what day would die upon the cross of Calvary to the, remit the sins of the whole world. I believe that's what Hebrews 9.15 is saying. Listen to it again. He is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for what? For the redemption, that is the forgiveness, the salvation of the transgressions that were under what law? That is the first law. Jesus died for all mankind. We're not living under that first law. We're living under the testament of Christ, that is the gospel. And all the promises of salvation that we have today are based not upon that old law, but on the new law that Jesus gave when he'd shed his blood on Calvary. And friends, that covenant, that testament, that gospel tells us to believe in him. That, that testament tells us that we must be willing to repent of our sins. That, that testament tells us that we must be willing to confess our faith in Jesus. And that is penitent confessing believers, we must be baptized into him. Jesus said it best, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I want to thank you for watching today. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless and keep you. We want to help you as much as possible in your search for a personal relationship with God. You can now easily access our free Bible correspondence course online at gettingtoknowyourbible.com. If there's any way we can help you grow closer to God, please email us at gettingtoknowyourbible at yahoo.com or call us anytime at 1-877-711-5214. Getting to Know Your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580, or call 1-877-711-5214. Join us next time for Getting to Know Your Bible. If I were to ask you how many churches exist in the world today, what would you say? You might say, I don't know, a, a lot, I guess. And you would certainly be correct with that answer. There are over 43,000 churches that exist in the world today. Now I want you to think about how confusing that could be for a person who is seeking for the truth. Friend, may I respectfully tell you that God is not the author of confusion. If you open your Bible, you won't find 43,000 churches. You'll only find one. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church. Dear friend, our invitation to you is this. Let's go back to the Bible and be what they were, Christians only and a part of the one church that Jesus promised to build. We care about people. We love people. We try to follow the directives of our Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, he said that we need to abide in his word. We do that. We share the love of Christ. In John 13, Jesus says to do that, and so we do that. You know, we've been talking about salvation over the net last several weeks and uh, certainly have put much emphasis upon that salvation is conditional. 
based upon man's obedience. But God does want us to be saved, so he's done his part. Last week, we focused on the idea of repentance, having already studied about faith before, and we have some upcoming episodes that will focus about faith, faith even more than we already have. But this week, I want to think about the idea of confession. You've heard me on this program, if you've been watching any length of time, talk about that to take the first part of the condition that man has to execute to, to perform in his life to receive salvation is that he has to be added to the church. The only way he can be added to the church is that he has faith produced by the word of God so that it would lead him to repent of the sins that separated him from God so that he will confess Jesus as the son of God and be baptized. Now, oftentimes when we study confession, people have misunderstandings and rightly so. Television often will depict it as the idea that you go into a confessional booth and you tell a man your sins asking him to forgive you even though that's not exactly what the scriptures teach. Others will actually talk about confession as being part of salvation and will quote from verses like where it says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. And that's not exactly in context when you use it as a part of the plan of salvation. And then you have Romans chapter 10, verse 10, that talks about what the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made in salvation. So it would be easy to understand how an individual can become confused when trying to figure out exactly what do, does the Bible teach about confession. Today on Have a Bible Question, we're going to answer the question, what is confession according to Scripture? And in doing so, we're going to notice that there are different types of confession, and we want to focus in on the type of confession that can lead you to being added to the body of Jesus, henceforth being the the confession that is able to lead you to salvation. Thank you for joining me, Guy Montgomery, for Have a Bible Question, where we search God's Word for Bible answers to your Bible questions. So we're talking about confession, and there certainly are different types of confession that you can read of in the Bible. Now, the one I quote from a lot was that with Romans chapter 10, in verse 10, it says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And this would be correct to use when you talk about the confession that needs to be made in order for one to take the steps towards obtaining the salvation that's freely offered by God. It's important that we actually just take the time and perhaps read it in God's Word. So if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Romans 10. If not, it'll be on the screen for you. But we begin reading actually in verse 1 because I want to keep it in context. It says here, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to every one that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth the, those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on the wise. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, we see something important in this passage about Jesus. And sometimes we, we overlook this part of Romans uh, because we jump right down into verse 9 or verse 10, but we start at the beginning of the chapter because we want to keep it in context. And I want you to go back to right there where it said in verse 6, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Well, that's the Father. God, John 3, verse 16, sent His only Son to this world. Jesus was willing to come to offer Himself as a sacrifice. And He would be willing to die on the cross. Even though in the Garden of Gethsemane He would utter the prayer, Not my will, but thine be done. The next verse, verse 7, it says, Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. And so after Jesus died, he was laid in the tomb, but the tomb would not be able to hold him because he would raise again 
By what power was he raised? By the power of God. He does all this because he wants you to be saved. Why is this being preached? Because, uh, well, in this verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So what he's actually preaching here is Jesus Christ, him crucified, him slain. Him, he was laid in the ground, but he was raised again. By the way, this is the same message that was preached in Acts chapter 2 that we looked at last week when talking about repentance. That yes, Jesus is the Son of God. He died for our sins and the grave could not hold him. That's the gospel, the good news spoken of in Romans 1 verse 16. And so when he starts reading, when we read in verse 8, it says, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. <laughs> it's in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And somebody watching this said, But wait a minute. You said before on previous episodes that baptism is how you're saved. I want to remind you, I've never said baptism alone saves an individual. In fact, I encourage you, go back to YouTube, find that episodes that we talked about baptism, and you will find me saying that you cannot truly be baptized for the remission of sins to obtain salvation in, uh, if you don't have faith. Baptism alone does not save. Neither does faith alone, neither does confession alone, neither does preaching alone, but all these things work together in order to save an individual. So in this case, when he's talking to the church at Rome, he's emphasizing the importance of faith produced by the Word of God to cause an individual to confess Jesus. Remember, he's dealing with people that have rejected Jesus, trying to hold on to the Old Testament law, which, which Jesus nailed to the cross. Now keep reading with me in verse 10. It says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now the individual once said that faith alone saves. What do you do with this verse? Because here's the individual that believes, but it says confession must be made unto salvation. Now we're going to come back to this later on in the episode because this helps us understand that all confession is not confession made to salvation. But this is the confession to be made to salvation. And he goes on, verse 11, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Now, I, I pause for just a moment here because a lot of people want to, think that these verses stand alone, but let's go back to verse 8. He says, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith that we preach. How do they have the faith? From the preaching of the gospel. That's what he's saying here. How do people believe so that they shall call upon the name of the Lord? Through the preaching. So he goes on in verse 15. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings and good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed your report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So there is a confession that has to be made unto salvation. And that confession is that yes, the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. That which the Jews so adamantly denied, and that which will keep them from being able to be saved. Stay tuned. We'll notice some more about confession after this little break. Would you like to know more about God's Word, the Bible? We would like to send you a free Bible correspondence course. You take each lesson that we mail to you and complete it at your own pace. This allows for little pressure and for God's Word to do the teaching. Upon completion, Mail it back in the postage paid envelope. You then receive the next lesson in the mail. If interested, go to cmilestone.com or call 850-479-8878. Throughout history, the path of life has been for most an unknown path. The struggle of mankind to find meaning, to know from where we came, to ultimately know where we'll end up. Questions like, is there a God? Or what would God have me to do? All these questions can have an answer if we know where to look. The Bible. At Milestone, we offer biblical worship, Bible classes, 
website resources, and more. Learn more about us at cocmilestone.com. Check out our Facebook page, or better yet, visit us in person. We've already noted that there are several different types of confession that can be made. And so the most recent one we were talking about on the program is the idea of confession unto salvation. I want to continue with that thought before going on to other types of confession that appear in the Bible, as well as maybe the confusion or the types of confession that you don't read of in the Bible. And so when we think about the confession that's made unto salvation, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, we need to realize we actually not only have it being commanded and taught there, we have a great example of it in the book of Acts. If you've got your Bibles, you want to turn, we're going to go to the book of Acts and we're going to go to around chapter 8 if we can. Because in chapter 6, we actually read of a problem where the Grecian widows were being neglected and so there was this murmuring that was taking place. Upon the apostles' instructions, they appointed seven men that were full of the Spirit, met qualifications that they could minister to those Grecian widows. We actually go on and see in the next chapter, one of those men in chapter 7 was Stephen, and he would preach, and as he went forth preaching, uh, he made some people angry, and this led to him being stoned. And we also come to chapter 8, and you have that uh, Philip was actually preaching in Samaria, and this is where you read about Simon the sorcerer. But I want to go deeper into chapter 8, down to about verse 26, and it's here that we read, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? I love this part because here is a man, the Ethiopian eunuch, that's devoted. He had been to Jerusalem to worship. He's traveling back. And what's he doing? He's still reading scripture. He's reading from the prophet Isaiah. That's such a logical question. Do you understand what you read? And the Ethiopian's answer is noticed right here in the next verse when he says, And he said, How can I accept some man? should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture that he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. And in his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. Remember Romans 10? When it talks about how shall they believe unless they uh, have heard, how shall they hear unless it be preached, how shall it be preached unless they be sent. Now we have Philip being sent to be able to go to the Ethiopian eunuch to preach so that there can be belief. Now we backtrack that in Romans 10, that logical flow, we think about confession unto salvation. And so keep reading with me. Verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart that thou mayest. And he answered and said, Notice this, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Go back to Romans 10. <laughs> he was preaching to him what? what? What confession is able to be made? It's about that Jesus is the Son of God that has been sent to this world, John 3, 16, so that he could die for our sins to be raised again. That is the great confession that needs to be made right here. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Why did he rejoice? Because he was saved because he was baptized. But what had to take place before the baptizing to wash away the sins, Acts 22, 16? Right here, he had to confess Jesus Christ as the Lord. So not only do we see the commandment and the teaching of it in Romans 10, we see it put into practice when it came to the Ethiopian eunuch and his conversion in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 and following. Stay tuned, and we're going to notice a different type of confession that we can read of in God's Word. We hope you're enjoying the program, but here's a question for you. 
Do you live in the Milton Pace area and want to know more about Jesus? If so, then we invite you to the Margaret Street Church of Christ in Milton, Florida. We're a loving family striving to know Jesus and follow His teachings in the New Testament. We offer classes and activities for all ages of children and youth, verse-by-verse Bible study for adults, and family-based events throughout the year. Check us out at MargaretStreetChurchOfChrist.org or on social media. Come see what our Margaret Street family is all about. Your life will be blessed. The streets that are purest gold. So we've noticed the confession that's made unto salvation, but there's another type of confession that you can speak, um, read of in the New Testament scriptures. If you got your Bibles, go with me to Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to start reading back around verse 28. Now, it's in this that chapter that Jesus is getting ready to send the apostles out on the limited commission. He's going to give them some warnings because when the gospel is being preached, and that's what's necessary to produce faith in order to lead to confessing Jesus as the Son of God. Because remember, preaching is all about the gospel, which is about Jesus and the good news. And the good news is that Jesus was sent by God in order to die for our sins, to be resurrected so that we can be called up to live in heaven with him. That's the gospel. That's that good news. You cannot preach the gospel without preaching Jesus. And so he's sending them out, limited commission. Later on, it'll be the great commission in Matthew 28. But right now, it's that limited commission that he's preparing them to go out for. Now, he's going to warn them that there's going to be opposition, which isn't unusual. Every time people have preached the message of God, when you look through Scripture, there is opposition that is met. And so he's kind of building them up, so to speak. And we pick up reading in verse 28. He says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, if we just read there, that's it's kind of negative right there. It would be kind of fearful uh, that there is someone that can kill both body and soul in hell. But look at verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, as a youngster, this verse kind of scared me, because what this verse tells me is that God is watching everything, and I didn't always do as I was supposed to do as a youngster. And so when I was doing wrong, I thought about that all-seeing eye up there that's seeing that, and it would always intimidate me. Um, Sometimes not enough, because thinking about that should have kept me from doing wrong. But this verse isn't about fear right here. It's about comfort. Because he's saying if there's two sparrows and one dies, God knows it. In fact, the very number of hairs on your head. Now, to some of us, that's more than others. But he knows the number of hairs on your head. And what's interesting about that is it's always changing, isn't it? But God knows you. He he knows what's going on in your life. And so he goes on to the next verse that says, Uh, Fear ye not, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth, but I came came not to send peace, but a sword. Now, in this passage, the confession is being willing to preach Jesus. In context, he's telling them, don't be fearful of people that can kill the body. (laughs) That's just temporary because they can take your life away, but if you're in Christ, you live forever. And, and, And God's there to take care of you. So don't be fearful of those things, but be willing to confess, teach, profess Him through your actions in life. Be willing to live for Jesus. And if you do, He'll be willing to confess you come judgment day before the Father. Stay tuned. There's a third type of confession that Christians need to make. We'll notice that in just a moment. The Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies has been training leaders for the church since 1987. The school has a full-time resident program in which a man comes for two years and studies every single book of the Bible, along with related subjects. Students also learn servitude, leadership development, and current technology. Not only is the resident program tuition free, but housing is also provided for free to single students. Learn more about this at nwfsbs.org. So we've noticed two types of confession that the Bible speaks of. 
There's the type of confession that is unto salvation. Then there's the confessing in the sense that we will live our life and not be afraid to teach and preach the gospel and live the gospel in front of others. The third type that the Bible speaks of is one that's kind of misconstrued at times, but it's a very important part of confession. We read of this in James chapter 5 and verse 16. I'll back up just a little bit to set it in context. We begin reading in verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Now here we're being encouraged to confess your faults one to another. I kept it in context because in James, especially in the closing end of this, he's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to the church. So it's the, the, these are people that have already confessed Jesus for the purpose of unto salvation. Uh, it's also not the living here because he's talking about to each other. This confession is literally confessing your faults. Now, we all have faults. We have shortcomings. And being a Christian doesn't take away the idea that we will still err. Uh, you know, think about what we were talking about earlier. I, I just made a brief mention that Philip had preached in Samaria and Simon the sorcerer ha had been converted. And right after his conversion, he actually messes up because what happens is he wants to buy the power that the apostles had because he saw it was true compared to his false deceiving he had been doing for the people. But that sin of covetousness, that fault that he had, he wasn't rid of yet. And so he was rebuked for this, and he actually told them that he was, uh, he expressed his sorrow, his repentance, and he, because he was already a Christian, had already been baptized, he was told just to pray for forgiveness. That's what James is talking about. You have faults, confess them to each other. Now, it doesn't say priest. I realize there's a misnomer out there that is often conveyed when you watch television and you have people going into confessional booths and they go to a man that they call father, say, Father, forgive me, even though the scripture does not set any precedent for us calling men here on this earth father uh, in the sense of a spiritual father. Uh, we certainly understand from the New Testament that all Christians technically are priests with Christ being our high priest. But this is just a brother to brother, sister to sister, confessing their faults and praying for one another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You don't need a confessional booth. You don't need a man that wears a collar. You don't read of that in the Bible. You just need a Christian that you are helping each other along through this world. Hebrews 10 talks about provoking one another unto love and good works and numerous passages that we as Christians edify each other. I remember as a youngster, we uh, bought a building that once was used uh, for, a, for a religious organization that they had the practice of confessional booths. And, and we found it humorous as youngsters, as kids, to go in there and, and play confessional. But, uh, brethren, we don't need to play confessional. We don't need to uh, make it somehow that uh, we are practicing something that God's Word doesn't teach. The power that is found in confessing our faults is the strength that we have from one another for the encouragement, for the admonishment, for praying for each other that all Christians can do. It's really a shame that more people don't do this. If we can acknowledge our fault and we can pray for each other, we can then strengthen and encourage. Think about it in this regard. If you have somebody that's an alcoholic, they are encouraged through the AA program that they have got to acknowledge their problem. They have to first be able to introduce themselves and say their name and say, I am an alcoholic. Why? Because to deal with their problem, they first have to recognize the problem. The same is true with our faults when we fall short of God. If we're having a problem with covetousness, if we're having a problem of uh, any difficulty in life, not loving somebody, we're uh, having a problem with bitterness, if we can confess our fault to our brethren, we have prayer to, to ask God for forgiveness and strength, then we as brethren can encourage each other. 
let us make sure we confess our faults one to another, as we have noticed here in James chapter 5, verse 16. Do you ever get confused when studying the Bible on your own, but you feel uncomfortable or lost studying in a large group? Or perhaps you don't have the time to commit to a regular scheduled Bible class, but you still hunger and thirst for the Word of God? Then try our free online Bible course from the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies. These classes provide a clear, concise, and thorough Bible study in the comfort of your own home. You take the course on your schedule and at your own pace. Sign up today at courses.nwfsbs.org or learn more about Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies at nwfsbs.org. So today we've been answering the question, what is confession? We've, we've tried to make sure we answer this with a Bible answer to your Bible question so that we know what God says, not what man says regarding this. We've noticed three types of confession that the Bible speaks of. First, a confession that's made unto salvation, Romans 10, verses 9 and verse 10. And this is exactly what the Ethiopian eunuch did. The second type is a confession that you make when you live for Christ and are willing to proclaim Him as you go throughout the world spreading His gospel. The third type is as a Christian, when you have failings, when you have faults, when you sin, that you are willing to confess that to other faithful brethren for their prayers, for their admonition, and their encouragement. I encourage you, don't be like we were as children playing confession but be serious about the confessions that you need to make in your life. If you need help confessing Christ as the Son of God so that you can be baptized, contact us. We'll be happy to put you in touch with a body of believers, a part of the Church of Christ that we read of in the New Testament in your area. And you can be sure to confess Jesus as the Son of God and put Him on in baptism. Make sure that you tune in next week as we continue to search God's Word for Bible answers to your Bible questions. In a world of religious division and biblical misunderstanding, it is very easy to be confused about what God would have us to do. Join Guyton Montgomery each Sunday morning on this station for Have a Bible Question. Expect to receive a Bible answer to your Bible question. Thank you for watching Have a Bible Question, brought to you by the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies and the Church of Christ at Milestone. Visit our websites at nwfsbs.org or cocmilestone.com. Thank you for your interest in Have a Bible Question. If you would like to contact us with a comment or question, you can visit our website at haveabiblequestion.com. You can email us at questions at haveabiblequestion.com. Or if you would prefer to write a letter, you can write us at Have a Bible Question in care of the Church of Christ at Milestone, 4051 Stefani Road, Cantonment, Florida, 32533. Gospel Broadcasting Network offers a free non-denominational Bible course. It's based strictly on God's Word and not the creeds or traditions of men. Why not contact us for lesson number one? Walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight. You may want to enroll by email. The address is info at gbntv.org. To enroll by phone, call us toll free at 888-805-3390. Oh.
life? Do we have to be baptized? Is drinking really wrong? Well, that's your interpretation. Where do I come from? Do we really have to have authority for what we do? Where is God when I need him? Rise up, O men of God. His kingdom tarries long. Bring him the day of brotherhood and in the night of wrong. Hello, friends. Welcome again to the Shield of Faith. My name is Wes Garland, and I'm an evangelist of the Churches of Christ in East Tennessee. And alongside with us, as always, we have Scott Gann. Hey, Wes. He is the preacher of the Philippi Church of Christ in Tompkinsville, Kentucky. And alongside with us, as always, we also have Eric Pickup. Hey, Wes. He is the preacher of the Gamaliel Church of Christ in Gamaliel, Kentucky. And friends, we hope and pray that for the next 30 minutes that you'll take out your Bible, paper, and pen and will study with us on the subject which is at hand because today we are on lesson four of our four-part series and on the subject of evangelism. And uh, the past three, basically what we have dealt with is why do we not evangelize? Then we had started talking about why should we evangelize? And the last episode we dealt with how to begin to evangelize. And today we're going to be uh, basically talking about what are the effects of evangelism. And guys, whenever you really start thinking about it, whenever you read throughout the book of Acts, you see here at the, the church in its infant state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And whenever the apostles stood there on the day of Pentecost there in Acts chapter 2, it started a wave. Absolutely. It started a wave that basically it, it started an influencing of people. Mm -hmm. And even upon the first time after they preached that first gospel sermon, about 3,000 souls were saved. And guys, it just kept on going from there. Mm -hmm. That's right. And you the read way... Over the, next, the next gospel sermon you read about, there were 2,000 more mm -hmm. men exactly. added uh, in Acts chapter uh, 3. You mm -hmm. know, and you just have this ongoing onslaught of people hearing the Word of God, mm -hmm. obeying mm -hmm. the Word of God, and the results that come from That's it. That's right. You know, you had people that was fearless. That's right. They, exactly. they were fearless in the face of trials, you know, and... And, and why were act. they fearless? Let me ask you that. Because they were militant. That's they were right. militant, uh, but what... Christianity, Christianity is militant. We're, we're soldiers of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's right. We're to contend earnestly for the faith. We're to fight the good fight of faith. We are to, we are to uphold truth. We're to throw down the gauntlets of error. Right. We're to... Mm -hmm. we're, that's our responsibility. That's and right. And so, mm -hmm. as we do this, as we go forth into a world that's lost in, in sin and uh, we have to proclaim the gospel. No military right. force would that's be right. effective unless it was aggressive. That's right. Unless it, 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 it stood up against. to the enemy. That's right. And, and that's what we have to do. They saw that these people were enemies of the cross of Christ mm -hmm. and they needed the salvation that's and right. they took it that's to right. them. Uh, you know, that's we right. see here in Acts chapter 4, you know, we see uh, Peter and 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 John, you know, it says... Uh, so don't you teach in the name of Jesus. Yeah, I mean, they were thrown right. in prison. They were beaten. They, That's right. Don't you teach anymore That's right. in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and they came to the conclusion that, you know, we've got to obey God rather That's than right. man. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no other name under heaven that a man must be saved but than Jesus Christ, according to Acts chapter 4 and uh, verse 12. You know, mm -hmm. they marveled. Uh, at, at these people, and uh, I think we cannot number, but speak the things which we have seen and heard, and heard. in right. Acts chapter four and verses twenty, and then you have those ringing and challenging right. words. You think about uh, <coughs> you, uh, you think about what took place in Acts chapter four. Exactly. Right. Here, these men addressed the the Sanhedrin right. uh, after the upon, religious after, rulers and leaders of the day that's right, after being arrested. And listen to what they said. It came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Just think about that alone. Mm -hmm. Think of the presence of all these highfalutin individuals right. that are up on the pedestal of Judaism and that are that are elevated in high standards among the people. Right. Here they are. Two men two only. Two men. Two men are standing before these individuals that are about to proclaim 
to them the gospel. Now watch what he uh -huh. says. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked them, By what power mm -hmm. or by what name have you done this? Uh -huh. Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, referring back to the miracle that occurred right. in chapter 3. The healing mm -hmm. of the lame man. The healing of the lame man. All right. Been lame since but birth. notice this, verse 10. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, watch it, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. That could have ruffled some right. feathers. I believe that might have been a little bit controversial. I, I, believe, that, I believe that might have been a little bit militant. You and see, you know, the, 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 the ironic thing about it is, is the Sanhedrin, mm -hmm. the, the Sadducees, which were the religious leaders at that time, they didn't even believe in the resurrection of Jesus That's right. Christ. That's right. So that right. was another slap in the face. That's right. And he that, said, he there said that is Je no that other God name. Raised. There mm -hmm. is no other name. Right. And heaven given among men whereby man must be saved. But, That's right. but you know, whenever you really start really thinking about the militants of, uh, of, of Peter and John here, what really brought them about to be that militant, to be able to stand up there to say what they needed to say, even though they, they were the only two men in the presence of the whole entire city, basically, mm -hmm. for what has just happened. Right even being beaten and everything, and they still did not let that down. And it's because what you just said in uh, verse number 19, I mean, just think about the, about the uh, boldness that they made the statement right here. But Peter and John answered and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. That's mm -hmm. right. Now, I, I, I'm you're, just, I'm you're, just you're, imagining you're the way the he's saying this. God. Yes. Okay, now just think about this. For we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and we have heard. That That's is right. the thing. They saw the evidence right there in front of them and they could not deny it. Right. They knew what they had was true. That's right. We have the same evidence exactly. here today that's written. We have the total, the complete revelation. They didn't have that back then. They didn't have it right now. They were going with bits and pieces, as exactly. it talks about in 1 Corinthians 13. And we see the boldness of this, uh, of their preaching. Mm -hmm. You know, and we go on over into uh, 529, and it says yes. we ought to obey God rather than men. That's right. And that's what we have. We have a divine obligation to obey God mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. man. When it comes, mm -hmm. when it so, comes to physical things or it comes to spiritual things, mm -hmm. we must uh, obey God. So with and, the, and, and w Listen to the continual thought and the, the continued process that these two men went through. When you get to uh, verses 40 of uh, Acts chapter 5, it says, And they agreed with him when the apostles, when they had called for the apostles and had beaten, beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council. They rejoiced. Now, mm -hmm. why were they rejoicing? They rejoiced because they were counted worthy mm -hmm. to suffer shame for his name. You know, now, so, now notice so, this. So what they did, they got beat, beat mm -hmm. and striped and beaten, but they counted, they rejoiced in that because they counted them worthy to beat them because who also, who also was beaten? Who also Jesus. was crucified? Jesus. Well, that's interesting whenever you really do a study of that word beaten there. Mm -hmm. It actually comes with a possibility of the mindset of being scourged. Right. I mean, the same way Jesus himself was right. scourged. Mm -hmm. And notice this, right after that happened, a whole lot of times people just made every single excuse and saying, okay, I'm not going to do it anymore. Right. But notice oh, this. Notice the, the, very the next brotherhood verse. today. What would they have done if they had stand, stood in the midst of those people? Those same actions would take in place. What would you or I say to that situation today? We would be less. Uh, we would probably come up with a few excuses ourselves. Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. what this rings out in me is Jesus. What he taught on the servant of on the mount. In, in but chapter before you five. go there, just real okay. quick, going back to what you were just saying, the verse you ended off with in verse forty-one, mm -hmm. where he said that that uh, they suffered shame for his name. Mm -hmm. Notice what it says. And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus mm -hmm. as the Christ. Mm -hmm. Right. That didn't let it, let it stop them. It just gave them more you motivation. Know, 
Absolutely. You know, I'm sure that they were sitting there and they were hearing these words that Jesus spoke on the Sermon of the Mount when he said in verse, is verse 5 and verses 12, he said, all right, let's go back to 11. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 11 and 12. Uh -huh. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute uh -huh. you, and they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So they persecuted the prophets that were before you. And see, so he, they, he told them to rejoice. And That's that was exactly what they were what doing. They did. Exactly what they were doing. They were standing, they had been beaten, but they rejoiced. Mm -hmm. Because they were in good company, weren't That's they? Right. That's they right. They were in company with Jesus, uh -huh. and they were in company with the prophets of old that spoke boldly before the kings of Israel in that day. You know, you their know? attitude, their attitude, and their love for the truth, and their appreciation for Jesus and what He done for them, which led them to to want to evangelize. Uh -huh. But we notice we're talking about the effects, which is the focus of our study, right. the effects of evangelism, right. well, we have some negative effects that occurred here. They right. were obviously put in prison, they were persecuted, they mm -hmm. were treated illy, that right. people did not respond like they wanted to. Well, that may be the case of the response that we'll get when we evangelize, we may get a negative response. Right. People may not like what we have to say, appreciate the truth, they may not appreciate, you know, they, they may not appreciate the Bible, they may not appreciate God, right. we may be in foreign lands, we may be in atheist societies. Mm -hmm. We may be in cultures that detest Christianity. Absolutely. So we may get negative results, but we have to we have to allow the love of God to resonate in our hearts right. and to bubble out of us Absolutely. the gospel of Jesus Christ, just like they did. Mm -hmm. And what we'll see is, is we'll be affected. Absolutely. People will respond. The gospel, what we got to understand is, it's not the man that's doing the evangelizing, that's God's power to save. That's right. It's the, it's the tool, it's the gospel that's God's that's right. power to save. That's right. It's mm -hmm. the sword of the Spirit. It's the shield of faith. It's, it's, those, it's what's contained in the right. gospel that is able to... It's the oracles to, of God. ...to cut and prick the heart. You know, if oh. you take the gospel, if you take the gospel, you, you can cut things out of people's life. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, can, you, can, you can cut out the mourner's bench. That's right. Uh, you can cut out the sinner's uh, you prayer. You can cut out the sinner's prayer. You can cut out. You can cut out these things that That's men. Right. You, you can cut out you these cut fake off, and You can cut out God. that faith only right. doctrine. You can mm -hmm. cut you it can out. Cut, yeah, you can With cut the a gospel. lot of things out because yeah. the gospel is God's power to save. The gospel will help you. Absolutely. That's the, the tool to be utilized. And so when we love God, we appreciate His message, and we evangelize, regardless of what happens to us, then we'll see good things happen. That's what happened to them. Paul Thousands made. of people were obeying the gospel Absolutely. as a result of Paul. Absolutely. You know, what we see in, what you see in Acts chapter 3, just prior to them going into prison. That's right. Just prior to them going into prison, notice what it says. It says, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that uh -huh. the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, whom he who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive into the times of the restoration to all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Them you shall hear in all things whatsoever he says to you, and it shall be that every soul who will hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Now notice, uh, as we as we end this up, ultimately what happens is individuals start obeying the gospel. That's right. Mm -hmm. In verse 4 of chapter 4. That's right. However, many of those who had heard the word believed. That's right. And that number of men, just men, mm -hmm. uh, came to be about 5,000. That's right. Now, I think it's really amazing whenever Paul made mention in Romans chapter 8, mm -hmm. and not only did, did Paul believe this, but the, Peter and John and the rest of the apostles believed this as well, whenever he said, what shall separate us from the love of God? That's right. That's right. It says, shall persecution, shall tribulation, shall trials, all these other things. He says, I will tell you by no means mm -hmm. shall anything separate us from the love of God. Absolutely. And because of this, that's why Peter and John made that stand there in Acts chapter 5. Right. And guess what the result was? Look at chapter 6, and verse number 1. Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying. That's right. 
you know, in, in this nation, in the, in the yeah. nation of the United States, we are not currently, at this point in time, suffering persecution in that way. That's right. right? But okay. I know that our brethren over there that's overseas are. Right. That's and right. it's because it, 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 of those people. Now, let me, let me finish this real quick. It's because of those faithful brethren that are still standing up just as Peter and John Absolutely. were right then. That's right. That are keeping the church alive overseas. Right. That's right. They had the mentality. And, uh, even here in the United States, it's not just overseas. It's in it's in our our communities. It's in the places that we live. It's it's mm -hmm. individuals that are proclaiming the gospel. That's that right. are wielding the sword of the spirit. That's mm -hmm. right. That are that that is upholding God's standard. Mm -hmm. That is. The, continuing the work of God. And I want you to notice, you think about persecution and the results of evangelism. I want you to notice this. This is powerful. I want you to notice in Acts chapter 8, as Stephen was just killed, as a result, Stephen died as a result of preaching and teaching the gospel. And then notice this, Saul was consenting to his death at the time of great persecution, there arose against the church, and it was at Jerusalem, and they all were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. I want you to think about this. Stephen was murdered by the hands of men that felt the guilt and the power of the gospel that was being preached Absolutely. throughout the world at that time. Saul consented to his death. Mm -hmm. Saul agreed to it. Saul right. was there. Saul witnessed it. We see in, in uh, Acts chapter 9, Saul, with papers in hand, is going to, uh, with, the, with authority mm -hmm. to persecute and to take the mm -hmm. lives of those that Absolutely. are preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. Saul, as a result of Ananias the evangelist. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. As a result of Ananias the evangelist, do you think about the, the courageous, res the results, the results of evangelism? You think of Ananias That's right. and how courageous he was. It in that here, that he was here a man is that is killing Christians, consenting to their death. Acts eight and verse one. Mm -hmm. And so now you see Ananias the evangelist right. coming mm -hmm. to Saul the murderer, the one That's killing right. Christians. That's right. And now he tells Saul the gospel that he was killing people for previously. He tells right. Saul the gospel. That's he says, right. why tarriest thou? Yeah. You arise, you be baptized, you wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. So we see. now you hear Saul. You think about the results of evangelism. That's right. Saul, the proclaimer of the gospel, now rises as now we know. Paul the apostle writes half the New Testament, converts thousands. And Absolutely. yet we mm -hmm. see. One person, the courage right. of mm -hmm. the evangelism of That's Ananias. Right placed the Word of God That's right. upon Paul. That's exactly and it right. burdened him That's right. enough to obey it. However mm -hmm. many, and Ananias, ha, ha, like however, said, many, however many people that Saul, or Paul rather, converted, Ananias converted one more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Think about See, this. that's all it takes. That's right. That we don't know and we don't understand the effects that's right. of one person. It resonates that we can, throughout the world. Absolutely. We, we sit back and we think, well, the things that I'm doing isn't amounting to anything. Right. Folks, we, you know, I've heard uh, of individuals that have have uh, run across tracks that has been thrown by the wayside Absolutely. and read tracks and obey the gospel. Absolutely. You know, I have heard of individuals that through the work of Vacation Bible School right. that mm -hmm. years later, mm -hmm. years later, right. they, 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 they think back to a time in their youth when they attended Vacation Bible School and they think, I attended the, the local Church of Christ uh -huh. when I was a youth and right. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in spiritual things. I think I'll go there. Right. And they go uh -huh. there and they hear the uh -huh. gospel. They obey the gospel. Right. We hear of individuals that, that, that uh, uh, because somebody came and knocked on their door, Absolutely. taught them the gospel, now they're gospel preachers right. converting individuals to the cause Absolutely. of Christ, mm -hmm. going overseas to, to Asia and India and Africa, helping people to, there to see the importance of the gospel. The, the, the things we do resound throughout the world That's right. as we teach it, the gospel. As, as we look at the New Testament church throughout the book of Acts, it was, it was the way that was spoken against everywhere. It 
it was the, the sect. Uh, it was everywhere name. spoken against. It was everywhere Everybody spoken Everybody knew who the Church of Christ was Absolutely. in the first century. Absolutely. Now, what we need to do is it, we it need turned to take, the right. world upside we down. We need to take the exactly. gospel. And that, there shouldn't be anybody in our community who doesn't know about the Church of Christ. That's right. Absolutely. They ought to know about it. They ought to know what we believe. They ought to know what we stand for. We ought to tear down error. We That's ought right. to build up the, our local congregations. We mm -hmm. ought to strengthen our people, encourage and motivate them to wield the sword of the Spirit, to, uh, to be evangelists to go out and talk to people. Let's think about this for a second. Every congregation wants to grow. Yes. Absolutely. Every congregation, doesn't matter where they're at. That's right. They all and now, th grow. Now, now think yeah. about this though. A lot of times what the congregations want to do is that they want growth, but they don't want to do anything. They don't want to put they the work in. to all of a sudden miraculously just all of a sudden start right. growing. Right. It See, never is going to work that That's way. right. Here's what happens. Sometimes what we do is, is we replace worship for work. Right. That's what mm -hmm. we do. We replace worship for work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, in other words, what we say is, is uh, we ask individuals. You can ask anybody. You can ask individuals at our local congregations. Is so and so faithful member of the church? And they'll say, Well, certainly he's a faithful member right. of the he's church. There he's, there the door he's there every time the door's He's there every time he every time he the doors are open. Oh, he's there. Oh, he waits on the table and oh, he leads prayer and oh, he leads singing and this person does this and he does that. As far as the worship is concerned. Right. And that's great. That's wonderful. That's that, that's, that's part of that's, it. That's, we, we appreciate yeah. that. But mm -hmm. let me ask that's you this. That's a necessity. Let me ask you this. How many people has he visited? How many shut-ins has he been to see? Right. How many people has he converted mm -hmm. to Jesus Christ? How many tracts has he handed out? How many DVDs has he handed out? How many flyers for the gospel meeting has he handed out? How many doors has he knocked? How much work for right. the kingdom of God is done. We when you read the book, That's when right. you read Matthew chapter 25, and you go through there and you read the list of things that are going to inherit right. eternal life, it doesn't have anything to do. Well, he worshiped. That's right. He came and he worshiped. He gave and, you know, we go through these aspects mm -hmm. of work. He was at the building every time the doors open. We don't hear any of that. That's right. It's about doing things for other people, right. teaching mm -hmm. people, bringing them things, being benevolent, yeah. and all those type of things. See, we have what we call a little church house religiosity uh -huh. going. That's we're right. keeping house yes, on yes. Sundays Preaching. and that's all we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not really doing the work of the church. You know, when we you know it's all right if we come in the building, we hang up our little cloak of Christianity on the door and then we take it, we, we put it on when we come in the door and we take it off and hang it back up right. when we go out the building That's and right. we don't think about religion we don't think about converting souls we don't think about evangelism we don't think about the work of the church any that's other right. day through the week but only on Sundays we're keeping house and that's all we're doing we need, we to, need uh -huh. to be militant that's right. like these New Testaments work, in is, invo work is involved in that we're, we're, you know we there are there are individuals that I know of. You know, there are, I have some friends in Virginia, and I appreciate the the good work that they do through their tent meeting campaigns, through their television programs, Absolutely. and things mm -hmm. like that. That that they're doing as far as evangelistic. There's works in India and Africa. There's works. Uh, uh, there's works going on here in the United States. And you know what they have in common? They're working. That's right. That's that's what we they have, have a work do. ethic they have instilled work. in them. That's right. when we and stand, they understand that Christianity, you have to be busy about the Lord's right. business. When we mm -hmm. stand that's what before, we have to be. When we stand before God on the day of judgment, it's not going to be just a list of things that we did not do. Right. You know, and, and because it's not going to be just a list of zeros. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. well, you didn't curse. Well, you didn't commit right. fornication. You didn't commit adultery. You dressed, you didn't, you didn't dress immodestly. And all these lists, all those things are important. And we must Absolutely. not do that. And we must avoid those things. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's also about how many people did you go and see? How many people did you help? How many people did you encourage? That's what Jesus what, said. That's right. Explicitly. That's exactly saying. what he was saying there in Matthew chapter 25. It, it, it's about those things that we do, those right. things that we work. And right. evangelism is about working. And it's not something that's so difficult that not anybody can do it because you can do it. They you, did it in the that's right. they did it in the first century they, with a lot less than what we have today. Right. They didn't and have, we have every aspect, right. every avenue, every every type of availability to us to reach the laws. That's right. And we're sitting back on our hands, but they were out there. They didn't in have Acts chapter 17, God. it says, when they did not find them, they dragged them, dragged in Jason's house and some of the brethren and the rulers of the city and cried out, these are people 
that have turned the world upside That's down. Right. That's now, right. they were turning the world upside down. That's right. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have tracks. They didn't have material. That's right. They didn't have correspondence courses. They didn't have gospel meetings. They went about daily from house to house, mm -hmm. teaching and preaching the gospel. Let me tell you this, if it happened before, you can have it again. can happen again. Absolutely. Right. So Absolutely. if the church wants to grow, and I'm telling you, we need to uh, be de we, we dedicate ourselves the to church, evangelism. The church used we to be hard. the church used to be the number one uh, growing religion mm -hmm. in all of the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now what happened? That's right. You know what? You know what happened? What happened? We quit. We quit working. And you That's know what's going to happen? Here's the chain, the, like here's we the, talked about in here's the previous. Here's, here's the the chain here's the was sad broken. Part. The here's, ball was dropped. That's right. Here's the sad part of the story is that years ago, years ago, good, faithful, solid men of God saw the need to go to Africa and India and Asia and other places and teach the gospel. That's right. And they did that, and that's mm -hmm. great, and that's wonderful. But yet what's happened is, is one of these days you watch and see, the Africans and the Indians and the Asians are going to be coming to America to and, teaching, us. and teach us the gospel because right. we have dropped, We've dropped the, the ball yet. in America. And quit working. We That's need right. more missionaries here. Right. This is a mission field in America. Absolutely. And we Absolutely. need people to come here. But, uh, but one thing that's, that's really need to be in the minds of everyone, God would never, ever command something from his people that was impossible for them to do. That's right. That's and right. I mean, whenever he said to the Christians, his own children, mm -hmm. go to evangelize, that means it doesn't matter how old you are, mm -hmm. you can do it. That's, That's right. right. That's right. You can do this it. Is, There's something you can do. There's something right. you can be involved in. Yeah. You, you, evangelism is something everybody can be involved in. That's everybody. Right. It doesn't matter on what level, whatever level That's right. that you're mm -hmm. at in your, in your Christianity, whether That's you're right. a babe in Christ, there's something for you to do. And we when can. you're mature, you're you're strong, you're you're a faithful, you you've been a preacher of the gospel right. for many years. Evangelistic mm -hmm. evangelistic congregations need to that one of the things that helps them is they, they need to teach as to others to be evangelistic. That's right. You know, we went on an right. evangelistic campaign not too long ago, and what we saw is, is we seen mamas and daddies taking their little boys and little girls with them to knock doors. That's right. And that was encouraging to me, and mm -hmm. it was encouraging, it was to, encouraging the to the young people. encouraging to me, too. And, and, and so what we saw is, is we saw individuals that was teaching the youth to be evangelistic. That's, that's right. right. That's right. And that's where it has to go. Mm -hmm. we, we are commanded to evangelize, mm -hmm. and we must, when we teach the gospel, that is the biggest part of the gospel, mm -hmm. because that's the way it's going mm -hmm. to proclamate. That's right. Mm -hmm. that's and, right. It's, and it's going to die out if we don't. That's if right. We don't, what we need to do as, as a church, as a whole, we need to repent of this lukewarm, Amen. indifferent, complacency attitude Amen. toward evangelism, and get busy about the Lord's business. Mm -hmm. And I think once we, once we decide to do that, then we can grow. That's right. But if until we do, we won't. That's right. Friends, I hope this has helped you to see really how important evangelism really is. Mm -hmm. Evangelism works. It works every time. That causes it's God's plan. That's right. Friends, if we can be of any assistance to you, please let us know. Go to our website, shieldoffaithtv.com. But until next time, may God bless. Just think about it. The people continued listening to his sermon, and they interrupted Peter, and they said, What shall we do? Now, Peter has already said, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In essence, they are saying, Explain that. What do we need to do? In Acts 2.38, Peter says, Let every one of you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. We need to let the Bible define its own terms. Mm -hmm. People hear the idea Whosoever shall call upon the name, oh, that must mean prayer, call upon the name of the Lord. That's not the way the Bible defines it. No, and if you think Acts 22, 16, uh, I just say, please, if you disagree with us, go study that verse. Paul's already prayed for three days, and yet Ananias says, arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Ananias gives us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and Paul is speaking, he's saying, look, calling on the name of the Lord is not prayer, because he hasn't done it yet. Right. Calling on the name of the Lord is arising and being baptized, and that's how you wash away your sins. Absolutely.
unsatisfied with just a cottage below. A little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one that silver. Welcome to a time of Bible readings and hymns with your host, David Kenny of the Wadsworth Church of Christ on West Good Avenue. Matthew chapter 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast in the prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. It is, for it is profitable for thee that one of the members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Again ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. You've heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. 
But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Flee as a bird to your mountain, thou who art weary of sin.
Saturn is probably the most recognizable planet in our solar system. With large bright rings encircling it, it is the sixth planet from the Sun and the second largest gas giant, about twice as far from the Sun as its nearest neighbor, Jupiter. Saturn is an intriguing planet with its size, its wide rings, and its diversity of moons. While all of the gas giant planets have ring systems, Saturn's is by far the most prominent. Once thought to be a solid structure, the rings of Saturn are actually composed of billions of small objects. The size of the particles varies greatly, from tiny clumps of ice to boulders larger than an automobile. Since the rings are a collection of individual objects, each particle, clump, or boulder is following its own gravitationally bound orbit around Saturn. Now, the large-scale structure of the rings we see has been divided into seven ring groups with various gaps observed between them. There are three prominent rings, A, B, and C, and there's four fainter rings, D, E, F, and G. The rings were given these letter designations in the order of their discovery. As a matter of the dark gap seen between A and B, it's named the Cassini Division after its discoverer. It measures 2,920 miles wide, which is just about wide enough for the planet Mercury to orbit inside that gap. So you can see just how enormous Saturn's ring system is. Its full width extends approximately 350,000 miles across. Yet this massive collection of billions of particles spanning hundreds of thousands of miles across is so balanced by the laws of gravity that its thickness is less than half a mile. This razor-thin geometry, at least on the scale of Saturn, induces a seeming optical illusion every 15 years or so when Saturn's rings disappear. This is known as a ring plane crossing, and the ring orientation becomes edge on so that you are looking exactly along the ring's plane. Through history, the times of Saturn's ring plane crossing from Earth's vantage point have been periods of great discovery. You see, with the beautiful and stunningly bright rings out of view, Saturn's system of moons can be probed with greater effectiveness. Prior to the era of satellite missions, numerous of Saturn's moons were found during these periods. And Saturn has lots of moons, in the neighborhood of over 60. Of these moons, Titan is the largest, and it's the second largest moon in the entire solar system, larger than the planet Mercury. Interestingly, Titan is the only known moon in our whole solar system to have a dense atmosphere. Even though it is large and has been observed for a very long time, very little was known about this moon. That is, until the Cassini satellite arrived in its orbit in 2004. It began its long mission orbiting around Saturn, and one of Cassini's primary missions was to study the moon Titan. The satellite released a separate probe named the Huygens probe, which entered into the atmosphere of Titan and descended to the surface. This probe gave astronomers a way to study the amazing features of Titan. And Titan turned out to be an extreme world, where its surface has been shaped by rivers and lakes of liquid ethane and methane. Saturn is an excellent example of the magnificent beauty and order in the cosmos. As one of the most recognizable planets in the solar system, Saturn and its ordered system of rings and moons reflects the design given by the great designer. Everything God created is meant to reflect His glory, and Saturn is no exception. As it says in Psalm 66, Come and see the works of God.
Welcome to a time of Bible readings and hymns with your host, David Kenny of the Wadsworth Church of Christ on West Good Avenue in Wadsworth, Ohio. When the moonlight glows, I'm blows around. Manifold wisdom of God. Manifold wisdom of God. Manifold wisdom of God. Manifold wisdom of God. The Lord has made known by His church the wisdom of God. He has made known by the church to all of the worldly powers. He has made known by the church the purpose He's worked through His Son. He has made known through the Spirit His plan from before the ages. And through the church all men shall know the wisdom of God. Manifold 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 wisdom of God. The Lord has made known by His church the wisdom of God. He has made known by the church to all of the worldly powers. He has made known by the church the purpose He's worked through His Son. He has made known through the Spirit His plan from before the ages. And through the church all men shall know the wisdom of God. Matthew chapter 6 Take heed that ye do not your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. For when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of, before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if an eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness! No man could serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? 
Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, for they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and is tomorrow cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Bible Readings and Hymns with your host, David R. Kenny, with The Church of Christ in Wadsworth, Ohio. Recorded at WCTV Studios with music provided by Andy Robison, www.churchofchristsongs.com. Bible Readings and Hymns has been produced by the Gospel Broadcasting Network. GBN Questions and Answers. We've got this good question today. What does the Bible say about kissing? 
You know, kissing is discussed in the Bible in two different forms. There is kissing that is a greeting, and then there is kissing that is a form of sexual expression. In the Bible, kissing was a common form of greeting, just like today people might shake hands. Romans 16, 16 says, Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 14 says, Greet one another with a kiss of love. Now some people have thought from these passages that it was being commanded that Christians kiss one another. And occasionally you'll meet someone who will ask, Why don't we keep the holy kiss like Paul commanded? But friends, I, I think this stems from a basic misunderstanding. You see, kissing as a greeting was something that already existed when Paul wrote. This is not something that the Apostle Paul or Peter came up with. In fact, I believe the emphasis of the Holy Spirit in the Scripture, the emphasis is on the word holy. Let it be a holy kiss. In other words, when Christians greet one another in the customary way, make sure that it's holy. Now, kissing today is not our customary form of greeting, and, and I'm glad for that, but, but whenever we greet, whatever our greeting today is, whether it be handshaking, hugging, etc., make sure that it is holy. Now, what about kissing as a form of sexual expression? Should people who are not married kiss one another? I believe that Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28 is a good guide for us because the principle in that text relates to lusting. A man is not to lust after a woman to whom he is not married. Now that's true when it comes to looking, touching, or kissing. Sometimes a, a boy and a girl will kiss in such a way that it stirs up sexual desire and lust in one or both of them, and that would be a violation of biblical principles. That type of desire is for married people. This is what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22, Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness. At the 11th of Leviticus, God required of the ancient people Israel to be holy as He was holy. The requirement was repeated at 1 Peter 1. When we have answered the call to holiness, we have separated ourselves from the carnal world and become reserved unto God for God's purposes. Those who have done so have become sanctified and are known as saints. Holy, saint, and sanctified are all forms of the same word. We are taught at the twelfth of Hebrews that no man will see the Lord without holiness, and that diligence is required so that one fail not of the grace of God. Perhaps two important things are being taught to us here. First of all, though a man is saved by divine grace, he is still called unto holiness. Secondly, it is with diligence that he develop and maintain the holiness to which he is called, lest he fail to receive God's grace. It is by diligence in holiness and by the grace of God that a man may one day dwell with his Maker. My Jesus, no. It's 729. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, we have Nathan confronting David about his sin with Bathsheba. And with the words, you are the man, still echoing in his mind, David realized his selfishness. And Psalm 51 is David's heart-riching prayer that followed. In that prayer, David teaches us four important lessons about the very nature of sacrifice. One, true sacrifice begins when we give ourselves to God. Number two, true sacrifice includes humility. Number three, only when the giver is consecrated does the gift matter. And number four, God notices true sacrifice. Why do we do what we do? Why did David do what he did? When we look at the words of David, we recognize that forgiveness was his motivation. Let it be ours as well. I'm Jimmy Holland. 
Thank you for watching the Gospel Broadcasting Network. The preceding program was a production of the Fort Payne Church of Christ TV studio located in Fort Payne, Alabama. Welcome to A Message from Heaven, presented by the Church of Christ, which meets at 2400 James Road in Memphis, Tennessee, where John Shannon Sr. is the preacher. Here you can expect a cordial greeting from those who love God and worship Him in spirit and in truth. It is our privilege to invite you to study with us from the Bible, God's holy and divine will made known unto man. And now presenting ministering evangelist John Shannon Singer. Hello, I'm John Shannon, and I preach for the Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, it's called the James Road Church of Christ. We meet at 2400 James Road in Memphis, Tennessee. And welcome to another program, a message from heaven. We are delightful and grateful to the God of heaven who have permitted us to uh, be able to present this telecast to you to bring lessons uh, from God's word. We hope that will be beneficial to, to you uh, as a viewing audience. Today, we would like to call your attention to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, and verse number 16. Jeremiah was styled as the weeping prophet. Uh, Jeremiah saw uh, Israel's uh, greatest uh, government fall, and Jeremiah weep over the condition of the southern kingdom. And Jeremiah tried with all his heart to try to get the children of Israel to do that which was right, but they refused. And finally they went into Babylonian captivity. But before they went into Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, I would like for you to turn there with me this morning as we bring a lesson and we will give the interpretation of the text, and we will make some applications for today. In Jeremiah, just one verse, maybe one or two verses, Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, uh, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. And God said, also I sent watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Now, today's lesson is titled, What Will Be Your Decision Today? In the book of Hebrews, the record says, The day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Paul said, Now, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now, Jeremiah said, Stand in the ways. Well, we have three points, four points we want to bring out, and we hope that we can get to these points today. Point number one, verse 16a, your decision about the ways. Point number two, your decision about the way. That's 16b. Point number three, your decision about the walk. That's 16C. And lastly, number four, your decision about the watchman. That's verse 17. Let's go to the text. The text says in 16A, watch it. Thus said the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old path. Now, apparently, there was a lot of stuff going on at that time, and they were doing a lot of ungodly stuff. 
a lot of stuff in their worship, in their, in their lives that was not contrary, that was not conducive to uh, what God wanted. And God said, stand ye in the ways. What do you mean? There's a lot of ways. Now let's make a few applications as we go on. Now, your decision about the ways. Now, would you just say any way will do? Well, apparently not. That wouldn't work. That won't work because in Jeremiah's day, God said, I want you to stand in the ways and I want you to see. What do you mean see? I want you to pay a close attention to all of these various ways. And when you see and notice and think about it, You need to ask the question for the old past. See, there's a lot of ways in the world in which we live in the field of religion, in the area of religion, realm of religion. There's a lot of different ways. And I know that you look on television, you listen to radio, you see it all everywhere we go in America. We see all these various ways uh, and doctrines in religion. Somebody need to stop and look and listen. See what's going on. Now, have you made a decision about these ways? Have you said within your heart, you know something is not adding up? All these different ways, all these different conflicting uh, doctrines and churches and all this stuff people are doing in religion and we claim, well, there's one Bible. There's one God, one Christ, one Holy Spirit. But we're doing all of this stuff in religion, and we're really divided. Why would the, there are too many ways? There's a lot of ways. Now, have you made a decision about the ways? Have you thought about it? Have you, have you seriously prayed about it? Have you thought about why all of this is going on? I'm reminded of what Peter wrote in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. We may turn there in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Notice what Peter said. Peter said, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And he says, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. Evil sp uh, shall be evil spoken of. In other words, in Peter's day, there was a lot of stuff going on that was not according to the way. And in Jeremiah's days, there was a false prophet that arose and said, Jeremiah's wrong. Jeremiah said, you're going to go into captivity for 70 years. But Hananiah said, no, it will be just for two years. Well, let me just tell you. Hananiah was wrong. And I think within two months, he was dead. And the children of Judah went into Babylonian captivity because they failed to do what God said do. Well, so what is your decision today about all these ways? Have you thought about it? I want you to think. And as you think and pray about it, I want you to read the Bible and see what the Lord say about different ways and the way. Well, point number two. He says, where is the good way? He said, now I want you to, point number one, he says, I mean, uh, the first part of Jeremiah 16, he said, thus said the Lord, stand ye in the ways. I want you to really stand there and look at all these various ways and see, look at what's going on and ask for the old past. Then he says, where, look at it, where is the good way? Now there's ways plural, but there's way singular. He says, now, where is the good way? Now, 
Point number two, your decision about the way. What do you mean? See, uh, I think it was Solomon that says, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end of all the ways of death. Now, there's a lot of stuff that seems like it right. it's right. But Solomon said, the end there are the ways of death. That's Proverbs 14, 12, I believe, and 16, 25. Now, a lot of different ways. Now, he says, stand and see and ask for the obeys. Now, there's only one way. In the realm of religion today, there very, we see Jesus said in John 14 and 6, well, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by through me. So Christ is the way. Now you know it's not within man to direct his own path. He just really doesn't know. So when you're talking about going from earth to heaven, you're talking about salvation, talking about being saved, watch it. There's a lot of ways out there people will tell you, but we have to go to the Bible, God's word, and see what the Bible says. Now watch this. The Bible says in Jeremiah 10, 23, Jeremiah said, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. It's not within man. We can't think or feel like we are doing right. We have to have an outside standard, an outside standard of criteria for men walking in the right way is God's word. And Jesus said in John 8 and verse 32, watch this, ye shall know, watch it, the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Now, well, if you don't know truth, you can't be free. You can know truth and not obey truth and you still won't be free. So you got to know truth and obey truth in order to be saved and to please God Almighty. Now, your decision today about the way, would you say there's only one way? I certainly, I certainly will. There's only one way. God does not have various ways for people to be saved. God does not have various ways of man going to heaven. He only has one way. He's got one Savior. He's got one scripture. Watch it. A set of rules and regulations for the people. Watch it. That will be saved. One way. Now, what's your views about it? Now, I'm reminded in the book of Acts, Luke recorded this about Paul in Acts chapter uh, 16 and verse number 17. The Bible says, the same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God which show unto us, watch it, the way not ways, the way of salvation. Look at it. Which show unto us the way of salvation. There isn't but one way to be saved. One way to please God. Not various ways, only one way. And I, I have to really, um, I have to be nice on that because many individuals think that you can just do anything you want to in the realm of religion and be pleasing to God. I'm here to tell you that's not so. Now, Jesus said, I'm the way. In Matthew 7, in verse number 5 there, and the account of where Jesus was taken to the Mount of Transfiguration, and God spoke out a cloud to Peter, James, and John, said, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. And whatever Jesus says, that's what we must, that's the thing we must do. We must do what Jesus said because Jesus Christ is the only one that came from heaven to earth, fulfilled his mission and went back. And watch it. He sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit left us direction how to go back to heaven. That's all right in it. Now, the way of salvation. What today, what will be your decision about the one way? Now watch this. Sometimes individuals get a little disturbed when 
gospel preachers preach the oneness, the one body of Christ. When you say the one body preacher, what do you mean? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into this world. He had a mission. The record said in Luke 19, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. Also Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 11. But he had to have a means by which to save the lost. And that means, watch it, he said that he's going to build a church. In Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus said upon this rock, the truth that Peter had just stated that he was the son of God. Upon this rock, I will build my church. What's the purpose of the church? Watch it. So people can be saved. And there isn't but one. Now, see, I don't have one way. There's one church. And Christ is the only one, watch it, with the authority to build it. Or well, somebody said he didn't name it. Well, did he have to? He said, it's mine. Matthew 16 and 18, he shed it with his blood. Acts 20 and verse number 28. He's a foundation in it, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. He's the only, only lawgiver in it, James 4 and verse number 12. He's the head of it, Ephesians 5. Now, what would you name it? You wouldn't name it after some earthly man because the earthly man didn't build it. Christ built it. And he knew exactly what he's doing. And he put the laws in his own church. And there's isn't but one law. And they're not made up by men, a group of men, who got together and decided they want to make some rules and regulations for his church. No, he made the rules for his own church. He's, he's over his own house. Hebrews 3 and verse number 6. And there's only one way to be saved. And that's through Christ. Now the church that he built, watch it, it's in him. There's one body, Paul said. In Ephesians 4 and verse 4, there is one body. One body. Well, Ephesians 4, 4 says there's one body. Well, what is the one body? In Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Paul said, has put all things on his feet and gave him to be head over all things. Watch it. To the church, which is his body. Now the body is the church, church is the body. Christ shed in his blood, and he paid for it. It's paid for. And all people that say must be in it. Wait a minute. See, I know in the religious world, they say many ways it doesn't make any difference as long as you believe in God. Well, the devil believes in God, but he's not saved. It's those who will obey King Jesus. Now, Jesus Christ built the church, Right? He paid for it with his own blood. And when people obey the gospel, they are added to it. Not them, it. Why? That's one one way. When you're baptized in the Christ, when you obey the gospel by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and baptizing in the Christ, watch it. You're baptized in the Christ, you're baptized into the body. The body is the church, and the church is in Christ. And you're saved. And you must confess. Duck yourself according to the commandments of Christ, 2 John 9. So what is your decision today about the way? One way. Well, preacher, how, how can I know which one is right? Well, it's, it's really simple. You must go to God's word and study it carefully. Paul said, study to show thyself. Approve a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See, one must study the word and rightly divide the word of truth. Now, it's very important that we go to the scripture to, in anything that we do in the realm of religion. Then you know you won't be wrong. Now, the controversial thing about churches. Somebody said one church as good as another, we all go to heaven in, very, in various denominations. That's false teaching. Why? Well, Jesus Christ never be a one denomination, and he never added anybody to the one, any denomination. Denominationalism is contrary to the teaching of Jesus. Why? The word itself, denomination, signifies division, and division is contrary to the teaching of Christ. 
Jesus prayed the prayers, recorded in John chapter 17, that we all might be one. That's Matthew, John 17, 20, 21, 22, and 23. So if we're so divided, people don't know what to believe. I'll tell you what we're divided over. See, these different ways got us divided. See, we're, we're not divided over the Bible, no. See, we're divided over human names and human doctrines. One individual decided they didn't like exactly what the Bible said about certain stuff, so they decided to start their own. Now, and now I often say this on television. Churches, for example, the church that you remember of, and that's the church that you're a member of, right? And that's the church they're a member of. Now, if you can't find your church and your organization of scripture in the scripture, how do you know it's right? And you see, you don't want to give up your human name and your human doctrine because of the tradition of me. And here I come in and preaching the Bible and the Bible only, and you may think I'm a little off. Well, you know, that preacher's kind of rough. You know, he thinks he's on one right. No, 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 no. The Bible is what's right. I can be wrong. I want to point that out. The Bible is what's right. And if we conform to it and to it only, we'll be right. Now, in the realm of religion, if you're doing something in religion, that's not according to Scripture. The new and living way, Hebrews 10, 20. Who's right and who's wrong? The Bible is what makes it right now. Well, there's only one way to be saved. Jesus Christ, we have the personal salvation, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, amen. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus Christ is the person of salvation, right? And when you obey Jesus, Jesus said some things that are very important. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I like him as a wise man that build his house on a rock. When we do what Jesus tells us to do, watch it, we are obeying the way. And Jesus said, you got to believe that I'm he, John. Chapter 8, verse number 21, I believe in 24. Jesus said you had to repent of your sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5. Jesus said you had to confess him. Before me is Matthew 10 and verse 32. And Jesus said, get it now, go into all the world and preach the gospel. What do you mean? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, right? He built and bought one church with his blood. And all men that's going to be saved, you ought to be in it. He was buried in On the third day, he was resurrected from the grave. And Jesus said, go preach it. And he that believeth, watch it, and is baptized, shall be saved. And there's a lot of denominations out there, and maybe you're listening to me, and I want to be nice. Who says you don't have to be baptized to be saved, but that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, he that believeth, number one, and is baptized, number two, shall be saved, number three. Now, who are you to say ye baptism is not important? Well, Jesus said it was. Well, baptism don't wash sins away. Let me point this out. It's the blood of Jesus that washed sins away. And the blood of Jesus is in his body. Revelation 1.5 is the blood of Jesus that washed our sins away. But here's the thing. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now watch this. The Bible says in Galatians 3 that we're baptized into Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, we're baptized into the body. But Jesus said baptism is not important. Well, why is you baptized into Christ? Because the blood is in Christ. But the blood is in his body. And when you're baptized into him, that's when you contact the blood. And the blood is the cleansing power. i got enough sense to realize that the blood of Jesus is the only thing to wash sins away, but you got to get to the blood. You got to get to it. You're baptized into his death. He shed his blood in his death. And when you're baptized in his death, watch it. You contact the blood 
and the blood washed your sins away. And you can't be saved without the blood of Christ. Is that all right? Therefore, baptism is important. Not baptism only. You get that faith, repentance, confession, and then baptism into Christ. Now, what's your decision about that? Only one way. Well, then Je Jeremiah says, watch it. And walk therein, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. Now, watch this. What's your decision about doing it? Walk it. Now, watch it. You know that there are many ways in the world. And you, when you go to Scripture, you find out it's not but one true way. And we pointed that out. Now, what are you going to do? What's your decision today about the walk? you got to do it. You've got to do it. Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall live in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will with my Father. And you know what they said? They said, we will not walk in. In other words, I'm not going to do it. That's what they said. The decision they made, they told Jeremiah, we're not going to do it. We know what's right, but we're not going to do it. Now, what's your decision about the walk? Would you do it? Well, your decision about the watchman. Also, God said, I said, watch me over you, saying, hearken unto the sound of the trumpet. Well, they would blow the trumpet to warn them about a danger. That's some things that you do. And you know what they said? They said, we will not hearken. Now, we talked about three or four things. We talked about decision about the ways, decision about the way, and decision about the walk. And the decision about the watchman. Now, what would be your decision today? Have you obeyed the gospel? No one will be saved unless they obey the gospel of Christ. You got to obey the gospel. Everybody that's saved must obey the gospel. And don't let anybody tell you, just believe in Jesus, and that's all you have to do. Wait a minute. The devils believe you've got to obey Jesus. Right? The Bible says in Hebrews 5, verse 8 and 9, in my closing. Though he were a son, he had learned obedience by the things he suffered. And being made perfect, he, Christ, became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. What will be your decision today? Would you obey God? Would you uh, learn the way and walk in the way and be saved according to the way? God bless you. A message from heaven has been presented by the Church of Christ, which meets at 2400 James Road in Memphis, Tennessee. We're located west of the intersection at James Road and Hollywood. Visit us each Lord's Day where you will receive a cordial greeting. Our schedule of services are Sunday Bible class at 9.15 a.m. and 5 p.m. Sunday worship at 10.30 a.m. and 6 o'clock p.m. We also meet on Wednesdays for Bible study at 7 o'clock p.m. After Jesus' temptation, Matthew says of him, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew 4.17 Two major themes resonate in his teaching, the kingdom and repentance. Jesus came to prepare people for salvation, the kingdom, and heaven. And repentance was a crucial step. As He was leaving the earth, He charged His disciples to preach repentance for the remission of sins to all nations, Luke 24, 47. It is difficult to read the New Testament and miss the emphasis on repentance. But what is repentance? In Acts 3, 19, Peter tied it to turning. Some say this means turning around or doing a 180. But more accurately, it's about turning our focus not to what is behind us, but to what is above us. Repentance is turning our minds up to heaven. We all have many questions. Where do we come from? Who are we? What's our purpose? The Gospel Broadcasting Network offers a free Bible course that dive into those very things. Start discovering life's biggest questions today.
It's a wonderful joy and privilege to be able to share the Word of God on Gospel Broadcasting Network. My name is Charles Cochran, and I have the honor of being pulpit minister at the East Ridge Church of Christ. If you're ever in our area, we'd love to have you come visit, or if you're watching our program uh, in the East Ridge and greater Chattanooga area, we would be honored to have you come and visit with us in our services. The times of our services are going to be given to you at the close of our program, and so observe the times and our location, and we'd be happy to have you come and worship with us if you have the opportunity. We'd also like to offer you a free home Bible study course. We send these through the mail, absolutely free of charge, with no obligation, and these are good basic Bible studies, pre-denominational. There are no uh, denominational teachings that you have to wade through and try to understand but we just go back and open up our Bibles and read the Word of God and let it be the light for our way as we seek to understand the will of God. And we can understand the Bible if we will take the time, open up its pages, and let it speak unto our hearts. We also want to invite you to visit the services of a congregation of the Church of Christ wherever you may be viewing this program. You'll always find the people who love God, who love His Word, and who are striving to simply go back and to be New Testament Christians. The Bible clearly reveals to us what one must do in order to be saved from sin. That is, that we're to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, John 8 and verse 24. We are then to repent of sin, that is, change our mind, turning away from an old life, turning to the new life that is in Christ. Luke 13, verse 3, Acts 17, verse 30. These verses encourage us to repent, to turn, and to change our mind, resulting in a change of life. And then upon that repentance, we will confess that Jesus is the very Son of God. As an Ethiopian eunuch asked the question of the evangelist Philip, Behold, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, If you believe, you may. The eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It is that good confession that one makes with their lips, that they believe in their heart that Jesus is God's Son, and then they confess it before men. And if we confess Christ before men, He will then confess us before the Father in heaven. Upon that good confession, we then go down in the waters of baptism, whereby we're able then to reach the blood of Jesus Christ, and that blood will wash away, cleansing us of all sin. The Saul of Tarsus was told in Acts, the 22nd chapter, Now why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And then when one arises out of those waters of baptism, he then lives a new life in Christ, raised up. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, raised up to walk in the newness of life. For a while, I want us to think about an example that we find in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12. In the Gospel of Mark, the 12th chapter, we notice that Jesus is in the treasury area of the temple. And as He's in the treasury area of the temple, there are men and women who are coming and putting in their collection into the treasury. Now, as Jesus watches, He sees that there is a poor widow. And this widow comes, and the Bible says she puts in two mites, which make a quadrant. This is a Roman coin, probably worth maybe a little less than two cents, two pennies, a small amount. And yet when Jesus watches this widow, the Bible says that He calls His disciples to Himself and said, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who have put into the treasury. For they out of their abundance gave. But she out of her poverty has put in all that she has, even all of her livelihood. It is an unusual thing that Jesus recognizes the giving of this widow to be more than all of those who give of their great abundance, out of their great treasures. 
Jesus says that this widow puts in all that she has. Even though it's a small amount, she gives in such a way that Jesus recognizes the greatness of her gift. All of us know that God requires, as a part of our worship and our service unto Him, God requires that we give. That we give out of our hearts of love, we give out of hearts of devotion, and that God is not just simply looking for the money that I can give to Him, but God in reality is looking for the heart. God is looking for the love that dwells within that heart. Jesus surely saw on this occasion in the treasury that this woman, this widow, gives a marvelous and a powerful lesson to the disciples of Christ. And thus Jesus teaches these disciples to see in this widow the might. And we're not using the word M-I-T-E of the widow. We're using the widow's might, M-I-G-H-T. For indeed there is a might in her giving that teaches all of us the lessons of what true, genuine giving from the heart is all about. We would say, first of all, there was the might of her sacrifice. The Bible describes her as a widow. And as a widow, she was all alone. Her husband had died and leaving her by herself. And how many there are who are widows who feel alone, who feel that they have no one as a husband to share their lives with any longer. And the Bible encourages us as Christians that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. So a widow is someone alone, someone that has sorrow of heart, someone that has affliction, someone that has no husband to help her. But not only do we see a widow on this occasion that is alone, the Bible says of her that she was poor. In fact, the Bible describes her as a poor widow. She then, in her poverty, out of the depth of what she did not have, she was willing to make a sacrifice for her love for God. The Macedonian saints in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 are described as those saints who out of deep poverty they gave to the poor saints in Judea. You see, it's not that we are not required to give if we're poor. And sometimes the poor in society and the poor in the church are always looking for others to give unto them. Yet we find the example here in Mark, the 12th chapter, that this widow, out of her poverty, was willing to make a sacrifice and to give because of her love for God. But we also see in the might of this widow, not only her sacrifice, but we notice her strength. For the scripture says of this widow that she was one who thought not of her own needs, not of her own poverty, but this widow thought of God. We would know that this widow was giving on this occasion because she loved God and she wanted to serve God. She wanted to give out of what God had indeed given unto her. The problem that so many in our world face is that we think not of God, we think not of God's kingdom, we think not of the fact that we are blessed by God, even though we may be in poverty. God indeed blesses us in a rich and a wonderful way. And out of that gift that God has given to us, out of His love for us, we in turn want to give unto Him. We want to be able to show the love and the strength in our hearts toward God and toward serving God in His kingdom first in our lives. You see, her poverty did not hinder her. She still came with a small offering in her hand. And that small offering in her hand was a sign and a sacrifice of her love in her heart. What I bring to God really is not in the great amount. 
God looks at the sacrifice that we make. If the truth were known, it is possible that in congregations and in churches there are poor widows who give so much, who sacrifice so much, and their poverty does not hold them back from giving unto God. While there may be those who have great wealth, great blessings, who give a small amount in comparison to those who give out of their sacrifice and their poverty. Not only do we see the might of her sacrifice and the might of her strength, but we also see the might, M-I-G-H-T, of her example. You see, Jesus holds this woman up before the disciples as an example of how we're to give unto God. The Bible says that she gave her all, everything she had. And as she gave her all, it is an example for you and me to be willing to give our all. The words of an old song beautifully express it in this way. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou mightst ransomed be and quickened from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given unto me? Who would doubt that she first gave herself? And when one first gives themselves unto God, everything is going to follow. And if I will first give my heart, my life, my love, my devotion, everything is going to follow because I've given myself first. The Bible says that she becomes an example of great faith. When she laid everything into that treasury, 